Welcome back to the tutorial on games. In the first part of this tutorial we have seen several um, applications of games on graphs in automata theory and in logic, verification and synthesis. Um, and we have highlighted the importance of uh, parity games, uh, positional determinacy uh, of parity games, which plays a crucial role in certain difficult automata theoretic uh, constructions. Um, um, and uh, we have highlighted the importance of uh, uh, developing uh, efficient algorithms for solving parity games. So in this section we are going to um, take a look at, closer look at the structure of parity games, um, including concepts uh, such as attractor decompositions, which underpin um, and proof of positional determinacy of parity games due to McNaughton uh, and Jelonka, uh, and we are going to uh, develop uh, that mm, uh, result uh, in uh, in detail uh, here. Uh, see how attractor decompositions uh, and their structure emerge from that uh, algorithm, uh, which can be also seen as a proof of determinacy. Um, and we ta will take a look at a few variants of uh, McNaughton Jelonka algorithm that have historically allowed to achieve uh, the best uh, running times uh, for solving parity games and that may still uh, be useful in the future. In order to uncover the basic structure of a winning set or winning strategies in parity games, uh, which is the attractor decomposition, uh, let's recall the concept of a, a strategy graph of a positional uh, strategy in a parity game. So positional strategies, as we recall, are uh, strategies that can be um, determined, uniquely described by a set of edges that go out of vertices that are owned by the respective player, either even uh, or odd. Um, and in fact, the uh, positional determinacy uh, theorem for parity games can be uh, stated in the following format, that for every parity game there are these sets of edges, one per every vertex of the respective uh, player, uh, as well as a partition of the set of vertices into uh, the so-called winning set for even and the winning set uh, for odd, uh, such that every cycle in the graph of strategy sigma um, inside the subgraph or in the subgraph induced by uh, the set of vertices and w even is even in the sense that the highest priority on that cycle is even and likewise every cycle in the graph of strategy tall is odd namely the highest uh, priority uh, on that cycle is uh, is odd. So here we have a very basic example of a parity game with six vertices. Um, partition of this set of vertices into w even and w odd and uh, strategies for player even and odd respectively. So these are the fattest edges, the three here uh, in w odd because there are three odd vertices in w odd and two fat edges in the set W even because we have two vertices uh, of even there. Um, and note that um, every cycle in the strategy subgraphs uh, of these uh, two strategies, uh, namely the graphs which consist of those fat edges as well as all outgoing edges of the opponent in the respective sets, um, uh, all cycles in uh, the, the, these graphs are um, winning for their respective player. So uh, now I would like to argue that uh, once we take a graph in which every cycle is even, this is an example of a graph we've already seen uh, previously, we can extract from it um, a tree-like structure. Uh, that structure, in fact, is going to, to, to uh, take the form of an ordered tree, and the order here, ordered here is, is quite important, and uh, we will call this structure the attractor decomposition, or n, rather, attractor decomposition 
uh, of uh, such a graph with only even cycles. So how, how are we going to, to do that? Uh, so here is, is, is one way to define, define n attractor decomposition. Um, so here's the construction. Uh, imagine that we have an, um, a graph in which every vertex has a priority and for uh, concreteness let's assume that the top priority uh, in that graph is 6. There are no vertices with priorities higher than 6. So let's now let's define set D uh, to be the set of vertices whose priority is exactly S. Now then we proceed to define set T0 which you should think of as a transient set um, and uh, or uh, we will also call it the attractor to D. Uh, so it's the set of all uh, vertices from which every path ends up in D. So there is no way to follow a path from T0 and avoid eventually uh, reaching D. So that's how we define set uh, T0. And I will write this double arrow to denote that from all vertices in this set it is inevitable uh, by following any path uh, to eventually hit the target of that arrow which is set D. So once we have done that uh, we are going to define set R1. In this case a very special way so that, that, that will give us one specific uh, attractor decomposition but as we are going to argue later uh, there, um, this condition, this requirement can be can be relaxed, and we will get other attractor decompositions, and that's often uh, a useful, attractive uh, thing to do. So we will define set R one in this case as uh, the set of all vertices in the subgraph obtained after removing these two top sets D and T zero, uh, from which vertex of priority 5 cannot be reached. So from R1 no path reaches 5. Now this set must be non-empty if uh, this set uh, of vertices which is obtained by removing D and T0 is non-empty. Why is that? Well because if, if from every vertex uh, in this subgraph we can uh, reach a vertex of priority 5 then necessarily uh, there will be a path on which 5 occurs infinitely many times or there will be a cycle um, uh, there will be a cycle uh, in which the highest priority is 5 because note there are no vertices of priority 6 anymore because they were all in the top slice D. Uh, but that would contradict our assumption that we started from a graph uh, with only even cycles. So, so that set R1 must be non-empty. Okay, note that uh, because uh, vertex five, vertex of priority 5 cannot be uh, reached, uh, uh, it is necessarily the case that uh, all priorities uh, in the set R1 are at most 4. Observe also that while there may be some edges from vertices in R1 that go either to T0 or to D, it is impossible for any edge to go from R1 to the rest of the graph that we haven't considered so far. Uh, why is that? Well, because if there was an edge from R1 to outside of R1, then because all vertices outside of R1 have a path to reach a 5, uh, so would the vertex from which that edge originated. Now let's uh, in turn define set <coughs> T1 um, to be the set of vertices from which all paths uh, inevitably reach the union of D, T0 and uh, R1. Now note that in this set uh, there can be vertices of priorities up to 5. One way to call this set is that it's a transient set because all paths eventually leave it. Um, another um, would be to say that this set is the attractor to sets to the unions of union of sets D, T0, and R1. And indeed, this is the reason why we are talking about uh, attractors here. 
we can carry on with this construction in the remaining set unless it is empty uh, we can again define set r2 like we defined set r1 by saying that this is the set of vertices from which within that remaining subgraph um, uh, no path reaches um, vertex of priority 5 um, this subgraph may contain cycles uh, but note that it cannot have any vertex of priority 5 and moreover uh, there is no uh, edge that goes out of this uh, set into the previous the until uh, now uh, unexplored part of the graph uh, we can then define t2 in an analogous way which is that the attractor to of to the union of d t0 r1 t1 and r2 um, and continue this construction until we exhaust uh, the set of all vertices in the graph now note that uh, in this construction we haven't uh, explored uh, the remaining substructure of sets r1 r2 and so on and indeed those are again uh, even graphs because if the original graph was even then all the cycles in those subgraphs are uh, are uh, even as well uh, but the subgraphs uh, now have significantly uh, well have uh, uh, priorities that are um, uh, at least two smaller than the highest priority in the original graph so uh, in uh, subgraphs r1 r2 and so on uh, all the priorities are bounded uh, by four so now we can apply this definition of decomposing a graph in this manner uh, inductively to those uh, uh, to those uh, subgraphs and uh, that's how we obtain an attractor decomposition so an attractor decomposition is an a recursive structure um, in which uh, some of the sets namely the green ones uh, get their own um, uh, decompositions now note that the order in which we have applied these operations of um, of uh, uh, collecting all the sets all the vertices from which all paths reach to what we have explored so far or all the vertices from which no vertex of priority 5 is uh, is uh, can be reached um, uh, the order matters and we are going to reflect that by denoting this uh, in, in a recursive structure of a decomposition of the attractor decomposition by um, a drawing uh, suitable ordered trees so uh, in this tree here which reflects the structure of this uh, attractor decomposition uh, the order matters uh, the children of the root which is labeled by set uh, uh, d uh, uh, is from left to right now uh, the first child is labeled by set t0 so it's the attractor the transient set then the second child of the root is labeled by um, well uh, that will be determined by the uh, attractor decomposition of uh, the subgraph r1 itself so here we have a whole tree uh, hanging down uh, from that uh, from that node um, that reflects the uh, attractor decomposition of set r1 uh, third child is labeled by the transient set t1 uh, the fourth child is labeled by again the attractor decomposition of uh, uh, subgraph r2 uh, and so on now in order to reflect uh, the highest possible priorities in each of those um, subgraphs uh, we are going to define uh, so-called levels in that tree in every a node in in the tree uh, is going to have its level uh, and in particular set d will be on level six then all the red uh, sets all the transient sets uh, will be on level five uh, then the roots of uh, uh, the trees describing the shape of attractor decomposition so far one r2 and so on will be on level four um, and so on and so forth now that construction worked if we made the assumption that the original graph um, was even namely every cycle had the property that the highest priority on it um, uh, was even what i would like to argue uh, is that it is not difficult to establish that uh, existence of such a decomposition is in fact equivalent to the property that a graph 
um, uh, in, in, in uh, graph all cycles um, are even. So what we have shown was that if uh, a graph uh, is even, then it has an attractor decomposition because always we can find a non-empty set R1 from which which allows us to continue with the uh, with the construction, um, and in this way uh, extend that construction to the whole graph, uh, exhaust all vertices in it. But it is also not too difficult to show that if uh, there is an attractor decomposition of a graph, uh, then uh, all cycles in it. Uh, are even. And the reason for it is uh, hidden in those gray arrows that we've been drawing while uh, describing the construction. Uh, right? So the intuition here is something we've already seen earlier, that um, we cannot uh, move to the right through vertices of very high odd priority. Uh, instead, uh, we can either stay in some of those uh, uh, green areas which have their attractor decompositions themselves and hence have only even cycles from the inductive hypothesis, or continue moving to the left, or eventually uh, up. And when we do move up, then we hit uh, vertices of extremely high even priority, uh, and hence that prevents, that mechanism prevents us uh, from uh, closing uh, odd cycles. Now, let me finally um, highlight that if we, from such a decomposition, remove all nodes uh, which, um, uh, which correspond to empty sets, note that it's only the red nodes that can sometimes correspond to, uh, to empty sets, then um, the tree of a decomposition has the number of leaves that is at most the number of vertices in the graph. Moreover, the height of that tree is really dictated by the uh, highest possible priority. So if D is the, the number of distinct priorities in the graph, uh, then, uh, then such a decomposition will have height uh, roughly D half. So now that we have uh, um, seen the concepts of an attractor decomposition for graphs that contain only even cycles, uh, we have perhaps enough understanding of what makes winning uh, strategies in parity games, uh, positional strategies in parity games winning for player even, uh, to uh, develop uh, uh, a proof of positional uh, determinacy for parity games. And that proof takes the form of, uh, of an algorithm that has been proposed originally for a more general case of Muller games by McNaughton, um, uh, but also then instantiated to the special case of parity games uh, and uh, presented in a uh, popular way by Jelonka. Uh, and that's the algorithm we are going to now discuss together with its uh, embedded proof of positional determinacy of parity games. So let's now generalize the concept of an attractor from graphs to games. Given some target set, let's call it capital D, we will say that the attractor to that set for player even, so here we denote player even by square, is going to be the set of vertices that are winning for uh, square in a reachability game on the graph where the target set to be reached in finite number of steps is the target set D. And this uh, set um, can be quite easily computed and now I will show you how. And in fact, this is the backwards induction technique for solving finite games. So we are going to compute the attractor for even to the target set D um, step by step. And in every step, we are going to include exactly all those vertices from which a uh, square can force a move into D in uh, one step. 
So the first layer consists of all the square vertices from which there is at least one edge and that will be the strategy for square one edge to move straight into D. It will also contain all the triangle vertices where triangle is the opponent of square uh, from which all outgoing edges enter D. So I hope you, will, you would agree that these are exactly all the vertices either squares or triangles from which square has a strategy and it is indeed a positional strategy uh, because it's just one of the outgoing edges from all squares uh, to reach D in at most in exactly in fact one step. Now if we repeat this construction and construct L2, the layer 2, to consist of all those vertices from which um, square has an edge into L1 and uh, all outgoing edges uh, of a triangle uh, go either into L1 or D, uh, then uh, we will have now collected the set of vertices from which square has a strategy to reach D in at most two steps. Now by repeating this construction until no more vertices can be included using one of such uh, rules, we exactly um, obtain the set of vertices from which uh, square has a strategy uh, to infinite number of steps reach uh, vertex in D. And we can prove that this is indeed uh, um, all such vertices because uh, we can uh, uh, then uh, argue that in all vertices that have not been included in any of the layers, uh, the opponent, triangle, has a strategy to stay in that remaining set forever. Right? So that's why we call this set a trap for square, because square cannot escape from there, and hence uh, square can never reach D. Right? And that's that's straightforward. Uh, con uh, straightforward implication of the rules that we used in order to construct the layers because if we cannot include uh, a triangle in any of uh, the layers that means that it has at least one edge that doesn't go into any of the layers we have defined so far and if we cannot include um, a square that means that it does not have an edge going into one of the layers computed so far. Right, so uh, what you can uh, interpret this construction as is a determinacy proof for a two-player game on graphs in which one player uh, has the reachability objective uh, which is to uh, on the path in finite number of steps hit set D and the other player has the complementary objective which is often referred to as a safety objective of avoiding uh, this target set D uh, indefinitely. So Right, the conclusion of this very simple argument is that um, reachability games and safety games are positionally determined, right? because uh, the reachability player, square in our case, has a positional strategy consisting of those edges that uh, move us closer to D in every step, and likewise a uh, triangle uh, on the rest of the game graph has again a positional strategy which is just any edge that does not cross uh, the boundary into the attractor. From now on, uh, when referring to winning strategies in reachability games as described here, the positional winning strategies in reachability games, uh, we will refer to them as attractor strategies. We are now ready to prove positional determinacy of party games and the proof we are going to present uh, can be also seen as as an algorithm and it's a recursive algorithm uh, that uh, was proposed by McNaughton and popularized uh, by Jelonka. What we are going to show is that remarkably positional winning strategies in party games not only always exist but they have this very special simple form uh, uh, where we can explicitly describe them as a union uh, over 
partition uh, of uh, the set of vertices of a collection of uh, reachability strategies um, uh, to various target sets. So how does uh, the inductive um, proof of um, uh, positional determinacy, which is embedded in the macnaughton jelonka algorithm, work? Well, there are three cases in it, and uh, two are quite easy. The first one is literally trivial. So the first case is the following. Let D, capital D, like we, as we've discussed before, be the set of vertices whose priority is the highest priority used in the whole uh, game graph. Now, without loss of generality, we can assume that the top priority is an even number. If it is odd, then all we are going to say uh, can be done by swapping the roles of the two players. So, the first case, case A, is when it so happens that the attractor for box, which is even, to that set capital D of the highest even uh, set of vertices of highest even priority is in fact uh, the set of all vertices. So in other words, if from every uh, from every vertex in the game uh, we can in zero or more steps uh, reach a vertex in D. If it is the case, then uh, here is a positional winning strategy for even from every vertex in the game graph. Just take a disjoint union of the attractor strategy tall on the set of vertices that are not in D and an arbitrary, really, really arbitrary, uh, positional strategy uh, delta on uh, vertices on set D. So now if even uses this disjoint union, the strategy which is the disjoint union of those two positional strategies, what's going to happen is that uh, the set capital D is going to be reached infinitely many times. But set of uh, uh, but set D has is the set of vertices of the highest priority, which is even and hence necessarily the highest priority seen infinitely many times is um, is a D, and hence uh, that is every every such play is going to be winning for even. So this is indeed a positional winning strategy for even. So nothing really, uh, nothing really interesting happened here, but that case is covered. So now let's assume that uh, the attractor to this set D is not everything. So there are some vertices and we are going to denote the set of such vertices, so the subgraph induced by the set of such vertices, as uh, G prime. So the blue G prime is an area which is not in the attractor for even to set capital D. Now, by the inductive hypothesis, now we are using induction on the number of vertices in the game graph. Right? We assume that D was non-empty and hence its attractor is non-empty, therefore G prime has uh, fewer vertices than the original graph. By inductive hypothesis, uh, th this game G prime has um, positional winning strategies for each of the two players. So case B is when it so happens that the winning set for triangle or winning set for odd in game G prime, which we denote by W triangle prime, happens to be empty. So by the inductive hypothesis, uh, in this set on this subgraph G prime, player even has a positional winning strategy, let's call it omega square prime. Now I'd like to argue, and it's again a simple argument, that uh, if we take strategy delta, uh, strategy tall, and strategy omega box, omega square prime, where strategy tall is the attractor strategy, 2d for even, for, for square, and delta is an arbitrary positional strategy on d. That strategy, again, 
is a positional winning strategy in the whole game. Now, why is that? Well, um, you know, either if we consider a play which is consistent with that strategy, which follows that strategy, either eventually it uh, stays forever in G prime, and then it is winning because strategy, the positional strategy omega square prime was winning for even, or infinitely many times. Uh, we uh, visit uh, the attractor to D, but then, again using the argument like like before, we see we hit D infinitely many times and win in this way. So we are now ready to consider the third and arguably the most interesting case of that um, argument behind the McNaughton Genonka algorithm. Like in the previous two cases, we consider the top attractor, so the attractor for even to the set of vertices of the top priority, which we assumed without loss of generality to be to be an even number. And now we are considering a subgame G prime, which is the complement of the attractor. Now, in case B, we assume that player uh, even won everywhere in that subgame G prime. Now imagine that by the inductive hypothesis, player odd has a positional winning strategy on some non-empty uh, set of vertices in game G prime. Now that, by inductive hypothesis, that does obviously means that on the complement of that set, player even has a positional winning strategy in that game, but let's ignore that strategy. And perhaps it's useful to, to remember that if we interpret, when we interpret this procedure um, uh, as, as a recursive algorithm, uh, in a way, the work done to discover and compute this uh, positional winning strategy on that subgame uh, is thrown away by the McNaughton Jelonka algorithm because the argument from now on proceeds only by um, uh, using that uh, winning set for odd in G prime and the associated positional uh, winning strategy there. So let uh, let omega triangle prime be um, a positional winning strategy on the winning set uh, for uh, for odd for player triangle. Uh, in game G prime. Now, what the McNaughton Jelonka algorithm does next is to compute the attractor, but now not for even but for odd, into this light blue set W triangle prime. Let's call this attractor strategy top prime and uh, let this. Uh, uh, be the uh, the set of vertices from which triangle or odd can reach this light blue set. Now the first argument I would like to now um, articulate is that the strategy, which is a combination of omega triangle prime and the attractor strategy, strategy tor prime, is a positional winning strategy for odd on that red attractor. That means that in this part of the game graph, odd has a winning strategy in the whole game. Not in a subgame, but in the whole game. Okay, so that leaves us with the rest of the game graph, which we call G double prime. And about G double prime, we don't know much. Yes, we know that on some part of it, even use, even has a winning strategy if we restrict ourselves only to the light blue area of subgame G prime. But information about um, how that strategy looks like and how it can be played is now completely discarded, lost, forgotten, because what the McNaughton Jelonka, the recursive McNaughton Jelonka algorithm, will now do is to make a recursive call to solve the remaining subgame uh, G double prime, the green area. So once that is done, second part of case C concludes now, 
So after that second recursive call is made, we will have a solution of the whole game. We will have a partition of the set of vertices into two subsets. These are the two subsets uh, on which respectively even and odd have positional winning strategies. So the winning set for triangle or for odd will consist not only of that light blue set and its attractor that we have discussed on the previous slide, but it will also uh, include the winning set for triangle or for odd in this remaining game G double prime. While the winning set for even in the whole game G will simply be the winning set for even in the green uh, subgame uh, G double prime. And it's not very difficult to uh, establish that uh, this is indeed correct, that uh, the combination of these three positional strategies guarantees a win for uh, odd and that this positional strategy guarantees a win for even not in the sub games in which they were not only in the sub games in which they were uh, computed but also in the whole game right so in order to to complete that argument we have to make sure for example that uh, from this green set it is impossible for player odd or triangle to escape somewhere to the left okay and uh, and that, that is guaranteed, for example, by the fact that we have computed an attractor here, a node attractor, hence there are no triangle edges going into that attractor, uh, but also by the property of winning sets in the parity game. Right? So there cannot be a vertex in the winning set um, uh, in this uh, green subgame G double prime, uh, in the winning set for even, from which odd can escape to its own winning set in that subgame G double prime. So, in other words, there are no escapes for odd from this set to the left. And likewise, uh, there are no escapes for even from these three sets uh, uh, to the right, and hence the winning strategies that worked in the subgames also work in the whole game. So, that completes the proof of positional determinacy of parity games at least for finite graphs. That also can be understood as a recursive uh, uh, algorithm for solving parity games, where uh, you can think of the algorithm as performing either uh, no recursive calls, that's case A, and after computing one attractor the game is completely solved, so that's that's from the algorithmic point of view that's a very uh, easy case, uh, where the algorithm makes one recursive call and after that immediately terminates with a with answer, that's case B, or uh, it makes two recursive calls, uh, one on game G prime, obtaining uh, a winning set for triangle which is not every, all of game G prime and then second time on game uh, G double prime. Now, if you think about carefully about uh, how all these strategies that uh, um, the McNaughton Jelonka algorithm uh, uh, uses to construct a positional winning strategy for both player even and for player odd on their winning sets, uh, then you will realize that uh, they have a structure. Uh, which is very uh, similar to the attractor decompositions that we have discussed earlier uh, for um, even graphs. Of course, uh, that's the case for the winning set for even, the uh, case for uh, the winning set of player odd will be analogous by replacing, uh, by swapping the roles of even and odd, both in terms of uh, even and odd numbers, uh, like priorities and, and names of players. Um, the only difference is that the concept of an attractor is now different, whereas before for graphs uh, an attractor was the set from which all paths end in a target set, here the concept of an attractor is that um, one of the players, um, 
in the case of the winning set for player even, uh, its player even uh, has a positional strategy in a reachability game with a suitable uh, with a suitable target set. But otherwise, uh, the definition of uh, this structure with, that we call an attractor decomposition uh, is is quite analogous. Perhaps the slight difference is in how we define sets R1. So uh, whereas for even graphs we had a very specific, very uh, particular way of uh, identifying those set, uh, sets R, the recurrent sets, <coughs> here we in fact just require that they are a trap for odd. So they have this property that odd cannot escape from them to the right in the diagrams that we uh, that we draw. Um, but we also require that they themselves have an attractor decomposition. Right? So here we have this basic structure of the top level of an attractor decomposition where uh, we only consider the highest priority and, and uh, you use the, this example priority six <coughs> and then uh, attractor decompositions of uh, subgames uh, in which the highest priority is at most four. Now note that um, <coughs> the attractor decomposition of player even and that for player odd uh, differ slightly and uh, this slight asymmetry results uh, is, is a consequence of the fact that um, if the highest priority is six then then there's no priority seven which could play a role of the top attractor in the winning set for player odd. Okay, so that's that's the only reason why the pictures on the left and on the right look slightly uh, different. But uh, let's uh, highlight this subtle uh, difference how uh, in how these sets uh, look like um, uh, by drawing the corresponding trees like we did for uh, for attractor decompositions of uh, of graphs, uh, and what we note here is that the tree for odd in this case, if the highest priority, as we typically assume, is even, um, has a root at the level which is uh, which doesn't correspond to any vertices, and hence uh, its label is is the empty set. Uh, now let's complete the analysis of the macnaughton jelonka algorithm and its underlying proof of positional determinacy uh, by um, estimating or analyzing the running time that uh, this recursive algorithm uh, requires in the worst case um, on finite graphs. But before we talk about uh, finite graphs and complexity of algorithms, let's just uh, uh, quickly uh, mention uh, what uh, and how this um, algorithm, how this argument uh, might work for infinite graphs. Recall that uh, one of the first motivations we've mentioned for uh, the need to establish positional determinacy of parity games was complementation of tree automata, uh, and in that application, uh, the games on uh, that on which we need uh, to get um, uh, positional determinacy are in fact inherently uh, infinite uh, because uh, because they are played on an infinite tree or some structure that is based on an infinite tree. So uh, it is essential to be able to prove positional determinacy not only for finite graphs but also for infinite graphs. So it turns out that uh, this argument of McNaughton and Jelonka uh, can be extended to infinite graphs where instead of uh, using induction you use transfinite or ordinal induction and what happens there is that sort of instead of uh, having this view that uh, uh, we make up to two recursive calls, uh, or, or maybe a more natural way to, to, to look at it is that we start with a game with some number of priorities uh, and then we uh, the second recursive call can be seen as a continuation of an iterative process uh, in which we repeatedly solve uh, uh, smaller and smaller games with one uh, fewer priorities. Okay, so uh, whenever we are at iteration i and work on game gi, we make the first recursive call on game gi prime, uh, and then the second, so in this only interesting case uh, c, 
uh, we shave off some attractor uh, of a winning set in the sub game and then we obtain the next game which is simply the next uh, the next game in the sequence so to say uh, so in a finite graph of course the number of such iterations is going to be bounded uh, in the worst case by the number of vertices because in every iteration we remove at least one vertex from the from the game graph uh, therefore um, if we view this recursive algorithm as having a top level in which such an iteration is performed uh, in which uh, every iteration solves a game with one, one or more fewer priorities, uh, then uh, we can view the tree of recursive calls of the algorithm as uh, having the original game G in the root, and then all these games uh, G I prime uh, as, uh, as um, children of the root. Now, since uh, it's a tree of uh, degree bounded by n and of height uh, at most d minus uh, 1 it follows that uh, the number of nodes in it and hence the number of recursive calls of the macnaughton jelonk algorithm in the worst case is is uh, bounded by n power d minus 1 so it's exponential in the number of priorities and unfortunately there are examples which show that uh, this uh, worst case can indeed be attained so so there are examples of uh, parity games for, uh, on which the macnaughton jelonka algorithm requires two power uh, omega of n um, recursive calls uh, or uh, on which uh, 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 the algorithm requires n divided by d power d minus one um, uh, recursive calls. Now one um, quick corollary of positional determinacy of parity games uh, which was pointed out by Emerson, Jatla, and Sisla back in the 1990s, is that deciding the winner in parity games uh, is in NP. And the reason is simple, namely, uh, if positional winning strategies always exist, uh, all you need to do is to guess a positional strategy that is winning, if one exists, and then verify that it is indeed uh, a winning strategy. How can can this be done? Well, we recall this uh, simply boils down to taking the strategy subgraph and verifying that every cycle in a strategy subgraph uh, is is even. Um, obviously, the number of cycles may be exponential, but there is a simple polynomial time um, algorithm which allows to to verify that, and that gives an NP procedure. Uh, now, the problem, intriguingly, is also in in coin P. Because by determinacy, if one player doesn't have a positional winning strategy, then the other one does. So verifying that a player does not have a winning strategy boils down to verifying that the opponent has a winning strategy uh, and hence uh, uh, membership in, in coin P. So that, that makes uh, the problem of, of uh, deciding the winner in parity games uh, um, well characterized. Uh, and there are very few uh, well-characterized uh, problems uh, over the years that have uh, survived uh, not uh, having uh, a polynomial time algorithm eventually. You know, famous examples include linear programming um, and, and primality. So, so that, that suggests that uh, solving parity games should not be too difficult. Finally, I'd like to discuss um, several variants of the macnaughton jelonka algorithm. So before I do so, uh, let me introduce two uh, very natural and very basic concepts. Uh, so, so one of them is called the Dominion, and that's a natural um, uh, winning subset uh, for a player. So it's a set of vertices in a game, uh, so Dominion for, for square is a set of vertices, this one, U, uh, on which player square has a strategy that is winning for her, while the opponent can never escape that set. So, you know, Dominion is a golden standard if every Dominion is a subset of the winning set um, uh, in a game. So, so finding Dominion is, is, uh, uh, is very useful because once you have identified a Dominion, you can just shave it off and then you are left with solving a smaller game. Now, the other concept is, is that of a snare. And as you can see, uh, a snare is simply a relaxation of, uh, of the dominion condition. Uh, so a snare 
is a uh, set of vertices on which player, in this case square, so it's a snare for triangle, so it's like a bad area for triangle, uh, so the opponent, the square, um, has a strategy which as long as uh, a play stays within set U uh, is winning for, for player square. Now triangle can escape from a snare, there may be some edges that go out of the snare, but uh, if those opportunities for escape are not used, then triangle will lose. So a snare for triangle is really uh, a bad area for triangle, from which, however, uh, in contrast to a dominion, a triangle uh, may be able to escape. So if we identify a snare, what we have learned is that we know that triangle will have an incentive to, uh, to leave, that, uh, leave that set. So note, that if we look at this fundamental concept of an attractor decomposition, then all these recurrent sets, both for in an attractor decomposition for even and in an attractor decomposition for odd, are snares for the opponent. Because uh, in them, players have winning strategies. Now, the opponents may be allowed to escape from them, but keep in mind, recall, that the opponent can only escape from them to the left. And hence, such escapes uh, can only happen a bounded number of times because before, uh, before a move up happens, uh, in which case a high good priority is hit. Um, so, so snares uh, occur naturally in the wild in uh, attractor decompositions of, uh, of winning sets. So this motivates um, a generalization of the concept of an attractor, uh, uh, which goes as follows. Consider that you have some set of snares. Let's call it a library of uh, snares. Uh, some of those snares can be uh, snares for uh, triangle. Some of them can be snares for uh, square, so either for odd or for even. Now, if we are computing an attractor this generalization, the snare attractor for even to uh, some set target set D, and typically in McNaught and Jelonka style algorithms, uh, it's always the set of vertices of the highest current priority. And assume again that uh, this uh, highest priority is even if we are computing the attractor for even. Then the snare attractor, apart from uh, just computing the set of vertices from which uh, even or square can reach the target set D. Um, it also allows uh, inclusion of uh, snares for the opponent. So note that they are uh, sets, so uh, um, an S, uh, this set over here, is a snare for triangle, uh, means that uh, as long as even is playing inside it and uh, triangle or square plays inside it and, and triangle doesn't escape, uh, then uh, square wins. Uh, so what we allow is to include in the snare attractor any such snare for the opponent uh, when it is the case that all the escapes for, you, for the opponent, so the only uh, opportunities for the opponent, for triangle in this case, to, uh, to run away from, from losing within that snare, are in the already computed uh, snare attractor or part of the snare attractor to uh, to that uh, uh, top priority D. Okay, so uh, we may at various stages of the iteration of uh, computing the layers in the attractor throw in some of the snares that we happen to already know. Uh, so, so this is uh, used in the following uh, snare attractor algorithm that was explicitly uh, formulated by Van Dijk, but is based on uh, ideas explored by Benerecetti, De Lerba, and Mogavero, um, uh, called priority promotion, uh, um, which uh, goes as follows. We uh, try to find more and more snares until we find a dominion. Now note that snares, uh, uh, dominia are special cases of snares, uh, and therefore uh, as soon as we find a dominion, uh, we uh, will have made progress because uh, uh, every dominion can be immediately shaved off and uh, uh, we are left with a smaller game to solve. Uh, 
so we start with an empty set of snares and what this uh, snare attractor algorithm does is to uh, do something uh, quite similar in principle to the McNaughton Jelonka algorithm but understood not as a recursive procedure but instead rather as an iterative one. So what does uh, McNaughton Jelonka do? Well, uh, it makes a, a top recursive call uh, in which it shaves off the top attractor to the highest priority. So imagine that that uh, 8 was the highest priority and now we shave the top attractor to um, to that uh, to the set of vertices of that top priority. Now instead of taking an attractor we take the snare attractor with respect to the current set of snares that we have already uh, identified. Now what does the McNaughton Jelonka algorithm do? Well it calls itself on a game with one fewer priority. It may be a not priority that is a top priority now. Uh, and then of course we compute uh, an attractor for the opponent for odd. Uh, but um, again we have a library of snares so we allow uh, the opponent to use snares as well to increase the size uh, potentially increase the size of that that attractor so we continue doing that until we run out of vertices so now th that if in the last attractor the last snare attractor uh, we uh, have uh, <coughs> this property that uh, uh, a player cannot escape to an unexplored unexplored part of the game anymore because uh, that last attractor was was very special it included everything uh, uh, else left and that implies that it is a snare itself and moreover it is possible to to prove that this uh, snare has not been uh, explored found earlier so it's a new snare that we can add to our uh, library of snares and indeed uh, um, that in also implies that this algorithm will terminate and find a dominion because it uh, simply enumerates uh, all the snares until it finds it finds a dominion uh, so um, uh, van dyke has found examples uh, uh, sophisticated examples on which uh, this algorithm uh, which he calls snare learning or uh, he calls it uh, tangle learning uh, he uses a different term from that introduced by Fernley um, uh, requires exponential time so this is not uh, uh, this is not significantly better in theory but it seems to work quite well in practice and perhaps uh, it uh, it deserves uh, a better understanding um, another idea that I would like to mention is that of uh, um, combining the basic McNaughton Jelonka algorithm uh, with the so-called dominion preprocessing. So this this idea is is uh, notable because um, maybe uh, a decade ago plus it was uh, a technique that uh, led to uh, uh, algorithms with the best uh, known uh, uh, running times. So recall that in the basic uh, McNaughton Jelonka algorithm that we have considered there are two subgames on which recursive calls are made so the idea um, in this variation of McNaughton Jelonka with Dominion preprocessing is to try to find to detect and delete all dominia of certain uh, size before making the first recursive call so now let's let's uh, see uh, why this may be um, a sensible idea. Well, if we make sure that we remove all sufficiently small dominia whose size is bounded by k of n uh, before making the first recursive call, that means that after we have made the recursive call, we will have removed some dominion and because this dominion was not discovered in this preprocessing step, this dominion is of necessarily is necessarily of size at least k. So now, of course, finding all dominia of size uh, at most k may be uh, expensive, but uh, the idea here is to trade off the cost of doing so. Uh, with the cost of making recursive calls of the McNaughton Jelonka algorithm on large games. So, uh, this idea has been implemented in the following way to improve the, the complexity of uh, solving parity games from exponential to 
sub exponential um, by picking uh, this parameter k to be roughly the square root of n where n is the number of vertices um, in the game graph so uh, this is exactly uh, the setting of this parameter uh, which uh, balances out the cost of brute forcing finding dominia of all, all dominia of size at most k of n uh, by brute force and um, the solution of this recurrence or rather the number of uh, or number of nodes in the tree of uh, recursive calls of a of a procedure uh, uh, which calls itself recursively twice uh, first on uh, uh, with the the uh, size of the input n minus one and second uh, the size of the input n minus uh, square root of n so this uh, peculiar uh, slightly exotic uh, uh, recurrence has this solution and that's what uh, uh, led to uh, the first sub sub exponential deterministic sub exponential algorithm uh, for solving parity games so here's another application of the same uh, insight uh, where there are two differences. One is that instead of using a brute force algorithm for finding uh, sufficiently small dominia, uh, a slightly more sophisticated algorithm is, is used. Um, in fact, it's an adaptation of, of so-called progress measure algorithm uh, uh, that we haven't yet discussed, but we will discuss uh, uh, next week. Um, and the second difference is that rather than uh, trying to find dominia of size at most square root of n, we are aiming for finding, detecting and removing all dominia of size uh, at most uh, cube root of n squared. So it's a bit larger than, than uh, previously, than square root. Um, now, it turns out that, uh, and that's an idea of, of Schreve, uh, who has uh, uh, found a clever way of adapting this progress measure algorithm uh, to uh, find all and detect all dominia of size at most uh, cube root of n squared in time which is um, exponential in d but with d over 3 uh, in the exponent and the principle here is again similar it's trading off the cost of uh, finding uh, right so the, the choice of this parameter is such as to trade off the cost of uh, uh, finding uh, all dominia of certain size with a solution of the uh, relevant recurrence for this adaptation of the macnaught angelonk algorithm. So because here we are uh, in an, uh, every iteration uh, guaranteed to remove uh, uh, at least uh, cube root of n squared vertices, uh, this can only happen at most cube root times. So the number of iterations uh, or the children of the root in the tree of recursive causes at most uh, cube root of n. Uh, this is the recurrence, and it turns out Sheva has shown that the, the solution of this recurrence is of the form n power d over 3 uh, plus some constant. Uh, so, so that was um, uh, an algorithm with the best running time uh, from 2007 until uh, 2017 when the big breakthrough came uh, in the form of a quasi-polynomial time algorithm uh, uh, um, discovered by Kaluda, Jane, Hussein of uh, Lee and Stefan. So next week we are going to uh, talk about the quasi-polynomial era uh, in algorithms for solving parity games.